frontiers, providing sexual and reproductive health care in the modern era of cystic fibrosis. On behalf of myself and my co-speakers, I'd like to thank the CF Foundation for sponsoring this webinar. I'd also take one moment to remind everyone that this is on sexual and reproductive health, and we will delve quite deeply into that topic. So just keep that in mind as you're watching and keeping that in mind with who you're watching it with. So I am Jennifer Taylor Kauser. I am the co-director of the Adult CF Program at National Jewish Health, where I'm also the director of the Therapeutics Development Network Center. I'm also the co-chair, or the, sorry, the chair of the Women's Health Research Working Group. And I'm joined by two other members of the Re Women's Health Research Working Group, Dr. Tracy Kazmersky, who is an assistant professor of pediatrics at Pittsburgh, and Jackie Schoberg, who is a community member who's also on the committee. These are my disclosures, most of which are related to the fact that I'm the primary investigator on many clinical trials here at National Jewish. These are Tracy's disclosures, and Jackie has none. So our objectives today are to describe the sexual and reproductive health care delivery needs identified by people with CF. We also want to identify differences in fertility to, between men and women with CF, understand what is known about maternal and fetal outcomes in women with CF, and then describe the potential risk and benefits of the use of CFTR modulators during conception for both men and women with CF, pregnancy and lactation. Right now, I'm gonna turn it over to Jackie so that she can give her perspective on the importance of the creation of the Women's Health Research Working Group. Thanks, Jackie. Thank you, Jen, and hello, everyone. I am honored to be part of this panel and speaking from the patient point of view today. As a 42-year-old female living with cystic fibrosis, I have experience with many of the milestones associated with women's reproductive health. I have seen a lot of positive changes come to fruition over the years, and I find it very encouraging that there is a noticeable, noticeable change in the focus to include research around this topic. Entering the world as a little six pound baby back in 1978, predictions for my future were very grim. So issues around family planning were not even brought up by my doctors. As medical advancements were made and there was a better understanding of CF as a whole, reproductive health came much more prominent and something that I had more and more questions about. I found myself questioning why my lungs seemed to have more issues right around my cycle and was preventing pregnancy different for me because I have CF? Later in life, um, I was wondering if I would even be able to have kids because it was highly, highly discouraged at that time. It was hard to approach my pediatric CF doctor since there weren't very many adults, uh, pedi uh, adult CF doctors back then, um, about birth control op options and cycle of regularities and safe parameters for starting a family because that really wasn't their wheelhouse. At the same time, the gynecologists were overwhelmed with navigating the multitude of prescription drugs, many that were brand new to the market, and untangling the impacts of hormonal changes on my lungs as a result of CF. I ended up getting a lot of mixed messages from my various care teams. And while all of them were very, very skilled in their individual areas, finding research or guidance on my questions and issues was pretty much non-existent or really outdated. Now with more advanced medications coming out like the highly effective modulators, there can even be more confusion on what is safe and when. The lack of knowledge around reproductive health really came into play when my husband and I were first considering starting a family. It took many visits to get agreements between my CF team and the fertility team before I was even approved to go on with fertility treatments. After seven IUI attempts, I was finally pregnant with my first son. The pregnancy itself became complicated because I have always carried multi-drug resistant pseudomonas. Trying to find the right medication to be effective for flare-ups and safe for pregnancy was a continuing battle for the entire nine months. There was also dispute between cl clinicians on what maintenance drugs were safe during this period. Top that off with some gestational diabetes and one round of food poisoning 
and it was a roller coaster ride to say the least. Luckily, in November of 2006, I delivered a full term healthy baby boy. Two years later, we were ready to try again for another child. This time, the CF team and fertility team were on board pretty quick without too much convincing, and I became pregnant with identical twins. This pregnancy was a different kind of roller coaster. This pregnancy, my pseudomonas didn't flare up as bad, but I did develop a twin to twin transfusion syndrome, which is completely unrelated to CF. Ultimately, this resulted in me having to undergo laparoscopic surgery and being on hospital bed rest for two months. While admitted, the CF team was trying to stay on top of my lung health and the OB team was trying to stay on top of the baby's health, which caused a lot of disagreements in my care plan. It all worked out and at 28 weeks gestation, I delivered my baby boys. One was able to be transferred to the NICU and my other son unfortunately never drew a breath. I was not allowed to see my son for two days until the CF doctors, neonatologists, and infectious disease doctors could all assess the risk of me to my own son. Because again, I carry multi-drug resistant pseudomonas and had cultured MRSA in the past, all of which were very, very dangerous to a two pound preemie. So I fully appreciate the team's dedication to safety and don't hold any grudge against them for making the decisions that they could with the information available. And that was 11 years ago. And as you can see from the family picture, that little guy is very healthy and happy. So why tell you all this? The number of people with CF getting to the age where families are a possibility is rapidly growing. And it's becoming clear that more needs to be done to understand how all these systems interact. CFers of the future should not have to navigate an uncharted territory like I did. I am so excited to see the trend toward making reproductive health a key point for the future to assist those with CF everywhere. Thank you for letting me share my story and be part of this amazing webinar. Now, I would like to turn it back over to Jen to hear more about what we've learned so far. Jen, to you. And I'm actually going to turn it over to Dr. Kazmersky or Tracy, as I'll probably say throughout the rest of this meeting since we work together so often. Tracy, you want to go ahead and take over? Yeah, of course. Um, thanks, Jen. And thanks, Jackie. That story is always so powerful for me to hear. Um, so I have a few disclaimers to start. The first is, is that I'm a pulmonologist. Um, I am not a sexual and reproductive health specialist. And I really, truly have no desire to turn CF providers into sexual and reproductive health specialists or into primary care providers. However, um, all the advances in therapies have led to a new outlook for so many people with CF related to reproductive health. And I truly believe that the CF care model must adapt to this new reality. Next slide. So, I wanted to start with a quote and back when I started doing this research um, eight or nine years ago now, um, I interviewed a 20 year old young woman with CF about this issue. And she said the following, it's always like you just don't talk about it. It's one of those things that's left to the side. It's like healthcare providers feel it's not as important as everything else, but sometimes it is. I mean, it wasn't life or death threatening, but it could have changed my life a lot. And I think I want to keep her words um, near and dear as we go forward uh, to really ground us in why we're looking at research in this area. So you never know until you ask. I'm a firm believer in this. Um, next slide. So a couple of years ago, we did a five center survey of women with CF age 15 to 24 years. And we found that nearly a third um, perceived that they had pubertal delay compared to their peers. One out of six had experienced urinary incontinence. Half had experienced a yeast infection. One third experienced coughing during or after sex half the time or more. And one out of six experienced sexual functioning issues on a validated sexual functioning survey. We also found in that survey, not surprisingly to me at least, is that adolescent and young adult women with CF do have sex. And they have sex at the same rates with the same number of partners and at the same age of sexual debut 
as their healthy peers without in the general US population. However, we found that they were significantly less likely to have ever been tested for sexually transmitted infections, to have ever used contraception, or to have ever been pregnant. So very recently, we repeated some of this work with a slightly older population. And at 10 USCF centers, um, we surveyed over 400 um, and 30 women with CF age 25 and up. And we found more things. So we found that one fourth of these women um, reported that their CF symptoms worsened during their menstrual cycle. Nearly half had experienced urinary incontinence. One third experienced frequent yeast infections. Um, this is several times a year or more. And over half experienced coughing during or after sex half the time or more. And again, adult women with CF have sex at the same rates as um, healthy peers in the US population. But again, they were significantly less likely to have been tested for sexually transmitted infections in the past year, to have received a pap smear or pelvic exam in the past year, to be currently using contraception, or to have ever been pregnant. Of the women in that survey who had become pregnant, we also found that half had not experienced any preconception counseling before becoming pregnant. And 8% of women who had a live birth received no prenatal care. So there's still work to be done. And I think that Jackie highlighted this when she was speaking, but you know, the face of CF has changed and more and more women are looking forward to their reproductive futures. In fact, in that first survey that I mentioned of 15 to 24 year olds, 78% are nearly four out of five young women. And of the second survey that I mentioned, almost half of adult women intend to have future children. Next slide. So I'm a qualitative researcher um, with a lot of my training. And over the years, we've done interviews or focus groups with over 70 women with CF on these topics. Um, and I think that using the words that women tell me in these interviews and focus groups is the most powerful way to, to get the point across a lot of the time. Um, so I wanna point out a couple of these as you guys um, can read through them. But the first is, um, one woman shared, I don't think CF providers think about vaginas. I just think they like to think about lungs. Um, another woman shared, I have trouble going to other doctors that aren't my CF doctor because I feel even when I'm at another doctor, it's all really CF related. Next slide. We also looked at what CF providers think and then what they do. So we did a national provider survey of nearly 200 um, CF physicians, um, physicians assistants and nurse practitioners. And we really found that the majority of these folks felt that sexual and reproductive health was important for young women with CF and should be standardized in the CF care model. That there were major discrepancies between how important people felt that this topic was to discuss and how often they routinely did it with their female patients with CF. And there were much more prominent discrepancies among pediatric providers compared to adult CF providers. So what's the way forward here? I'm gonna start with a very simple figure um, to think about how patients, providers um, interact with each other and then in the, in the scheme of the healthcare system. Um, and as you can see here, nobody exists in a va vacuum. So the healthcare system um, kind of surrounds every patient provider interaction. And when you think about how you can make change or improve a system, sometimes you think about patient level changes, provider level changes or systems based changes. Um, so we're gonna go through each of those. The first here is really toward the patient. So developing educational resources or decision aids. So we did this um, several years ago, specifically for adolescent and young adult women with CF, 
um, we partnered with women with CF, um, family members, and multidisciplinary providers to create 13 CF specific health guides um, for this population of young women at the Center for Young Women's Health.org website. Um, and you can see the, the web address there and, and all those are freely available for download and for viewing on any browser. You know, the CF Foundation also has fantastic resources on family planning and parenting with CF as well as fertility. Um, so going through their website and as well to kind of see those um, more adult facing um, resources is, is really key and very available. And I think that one question that often comes up is, you know, I don't, women will say, especially me as a pediatrician, they'll often say that um, they're sexually active, but they're not ready to start a family or become pregnant. Um, what kind of birth control is right for them? So my birth control um, app.org is a freely available birth control decision aid to really find out which birth control method might be right for you and which one aligns with your priorities um, for birth control. This is not disease specific. So this is not a CF specific tool and no disease specific options around decision aids like this exist yet. So next slide. We are um, very close to piloting what we're calling My Voice CF, which is a reproductive planning tool for women with CF. And this is gonna be um, a tool to help women um, plan to become parents or plan to become pregnant, but also prevent pregnancy um, and think about birth control choice. Um, so this is again gonna be piloted um, hopefully this coming winter um, to see if it really works within the CF care model. And then if that's the case, we really wanna see if it you know, is effective and really helps with improved patient provider communication and decision making around these topics. Um, so stay tuned for that as we test that and make sure that it's the right tool for the CF community. You know, the second part of this is, is the provider and provider so simple because there's the CF team and all the members that are on the CF team. There's primary care providers, and then there's also women's health providers. So one thing that I like to bring up is really creating the space for sexual and reproductive health conversations. So we found in our prior work that women with CF want to talk alone with their CF providers, and they want their providers to initiate these conversations. And this is doubly and triply important for teen and young adult women with CF. I find that sexual and reproductive health discussions really pair well with self visits with our teens. And again, I can't underline the importance of this enough. Um, in our recent survey that we did with women age 25 and up, we found that 41% of that population of women did not identify a primary care provider at all. And when asked who their main physician was, 84% named their CF doctor. The Power to Decide is an advocacy organization that developed something called One Key Question, which provides a framework for health providers who support women um, of reproductive age to routinely ask, would you like to become pregnant in the next year? The real question is, is this question right for CF? Um, and as we all know, there's many ways to build a family. Um, so some derivatives that I really suggest that we can consider asking are, would you like to become a parent in the next year? Or for our younger patients, um, since that sometimes feels awkward asking to um, a teen, would you ever like to become a parent? And you know what, not to belabor this, but it really walks you down this path with your patients if they answer yes, the next question is really around pregnancy. Um, would you like to become pregnant? And if it's yes, really going down that path to preconception care. If it's no, it's exploring what they've thought about other options for family building. If they would not like to be a parent and they're sexually active, we really wanna make sure we're doing contraceptive counseling. And then finally, the last answers to that question, which are completely valid are, 
I'm not sure, or I don't know, um, or it's okay either way. And that ambivalence is important to recognize as a valid way to feel. And we really should be asking our patients and families, how can we support them as they think through that decision? The last part um, that we can think about is systems level changes. And I'm really gonna focus on collaborations and what I'm calling smart systems here. So I once had a provider in an interview tell me, I don't ask too many questions because I don't know how to get out of that rabbit hole. Um, so I think that one piece of advice that, that people have found extremely helpful is to really identify partners that you as the CF team um, can have a dialogue with, whether that be primary care providers, family planning or gynecology, adolescent medicine, if you're on the pediatric side, maternal fetal medicine, genetic counseling, and urogynecology around urinary incontinence issues. Other ways to enact systems level change are to embed kind of clinical decision support tools in the electronic medical record to really enact quick referral and communication options um, to optimize the way we collaborate across teams. And in this era of COVID and virtual interactions, really to think about the role for telehealth, for preconception counseling, or extended visits around reproductive health. So don't wanna ignore men. So what about men with CF? And, you know, um, Jen's gonna go into this a little bit more in detail in her talk, but recently we developed a men's health research working group to really identify what the priority areas for research are in this, in this um, modern era of CF care. And this group, which was made up of various stakeholders, including parents of men with CF, men with CF, and then um, multidisciplinary providers, identified fertility, testosterone deficiency, and improved access to reproductive health services and care as the key top three key areas. We recently conducted 20 interviews um, with CF center directors from across the country. Um, and we're still looking at this data, but we really found that these were the key topics that um, they brought out as we talked about men's health and CF that it's important, but there's no standardization, that there's really no consensus about the recommendation for the utilization of semen analysis to assess infertility in men with CF, that there's many barriers to the provision of men's sexual and reproductive health care, that these providers really desire clear guidelines and patient resources, and that future research should focus on the role of testosterone and the impact of modulators on men's health. And again, importantly, um, we are also conducting interviews with men with CF. Um, and these interviews are still ongoing. Um, that's up to 23 and counting. Um, and thus far, and just looking at these raw, this raw data, that there's this huge focus on issues with poor patient provider communication around reproductive health concerns for this population. And this, these interviews are really the key groundwork as we think about future surveys of men with CF providers, parents, and intervention and educational resource development to improve this aspect of care. And I think I'm gonna turn it over to Jen now so she can tell you more. Yeah, thank you very much, Tracy, for that great presentation and really setting up the expectations that people have about what they need to know, what they do know, what they're being told, and probably most importantly, what they're not being told. So I'm really going to switch over now to discussing what's known about sexual and reproductive health in people with CF, and specifically what the impact is of CFTR modulators. So let's start first with fertility in people with cystic fibrosis. Women with CF have anatomy in their reproductive tract that is very similar to that of women without CF. There are some factors that can actually impact a woman's fertility with CF. One is her nutritional status. 
Fortunately, now in the modern era, that's usually better than it was, say, 40, 50 years ago. Also, there's been historically some delay in puberty and ovulation, but again, because of the care advances that have been made, that really has changed a lot over the last, especially 10 to 15 years. One of the really important aspects is the fact that there is a lot of cystic fibrosis transmembrane conductance regulator or CFTR protein in the cervix. So women with CF can have thick, sticky mucus in their cervix in the same way that they have it in their lungs and in their gut. The other thing that the CFTR protein transports is bicarbonate. So because there's impaired bicarbonate transport, you can have a very acidic pH in the cervical mucus, and that makes it much more difficult for sperm to penetrate the egg. But mostly women with CF who want to become pregnant and feel that it's safe in conjunction with their doctor can actually become pregnant. On the other hand, men with CF are most often infertile. In fact, 97 to 98% of men with CF are infertile because of congenital bilateral absence of the vas deferens or CBAVD. And what that means is that although most men make sperm, they do not have the tubes to transport them to fertilize the egg. So a question that comes up frequently is do CFTR modulators impact fertility? Now I'm gonna orient you to this table because I'm gonna show a similar table for several different aspects of sexual and reproductive health. So on the far left is the impact on sexual and reproductive health. And then along the top are the different drugs. One thing that's really important to realize is that when these drugs are tested, the requirement from the Federal Drug Administration or FDA is that they be tested individually. So for example, Ivacaftor or Kalydeco was tested individually, as was Lumacaftor, which is part of our Canby, Lumacaftor, Ivacaftor. Tezacaftor similarly was tested individually. It's part of Simdico as Tezacaftor, Ivacaftor. And finally, Alexacaftor, tested individually, but part of the drug Trikafta, which is Alexacaftor, Tezacaftor, Ivacaftor. And I would usually use the generic names when I'm speaking, but because some of them are quite long, I will use the trade names as we're talking today. So if you look at the impact of these modulators on fertility in animal models, you can see that at very high doses, both for Ivacaftor and for Alexacaftor, there was impairment of fertility, but those were at very high doses, so toxic doses to the animal. At normal human doses, we didn't see impacts on fertility. And in fact, in women with CF, we think that there probably is a positive impact on fertility of CFTR modulators. In other words, we think that highly effective modulator therapy, such as Kalydeco or Trikafta, is likely going to improve women's fertility. And why might that happen? Well, one, it may just increase people's general health and nutritional status, but more likely we think the mechanism is probably because of those CFTR channels I told you about in the cervix. So as the drug is impacting CFTR channels in the lungs and in the sweat glands and in the gut, it's also affecting those CFTR channels in the cervix, leading to decreased cervical mucus viscosity or thickness and improving the pH, which makes it easier for the sperm to penetrate the egg. And what evidence is there that this may be the case? First, 2% of women with CF became pregnant during the Kaleidico trials, even though they were supposed to be on birth control. There have also been several reported cases in the literature of unintended pregnancies in women who were taking Kaleidico. And then finally, in a survey of CF mothers, there were seven women who reported they were infertile. In other words, they had been trying for at least a year to get pregnant and had un been unsuccessful in doing so. But once they took Kaleidico, within on average three months, seven of them became pregnant. Now, what about the impact on men? So we know that men with CF have a smaller ejaculate volume than men without CF. 
And because the ejaculate fluid mostly comes from the prostate in men with CF because they're missing the vas deferens, they're not getting the regular semen, CFTR modulators may actually increase the volume because there are CFTR channels in the prostate. So as in the case in women where they're in the cervix, you're going to start to improve the CFTR function in the prostate, and therefore you may have an increased volume of ejaculate, but that does not mean that there is sperm in it. There actually have been several case reports of men who had testicular pain after starting Trikapta. And we think that's probably because of those changes in volume based on the impact of CFTR modulators on the CFTR channels in the prostate. So the question also is asked, can infertility be rescued in men with CF? And we think the answer is not at this time. So why do I say that? So some men with two CFT, CF mutations have infertility as their only sign of CFTR dysfunction. Also, there are some men with a single CFTR mutation who are infertile. So what that tells us is that the vast deference is very, very sensitive to the amount of CFTR function that is present. The other way that we've thought about this problem is looking at animal models. So most often people think of the CF mouse, but there's also a CF ferret animal model. And researchers in Iowa actually have been using the CF ferret model to study the pathophysiology or abnormalities that occur in CF and the response to treatment. So one thing that they looked at was what happened if you treated pregnant ferrets who had CF with a highly effective modulator I have a captor or colitico, and did they actually change anything for those babies who were born with CF after the mother was treated throughout the pregnancy? If you look at this figure, the first figure, A, is actually showing the normal testes, the normal vas deferens, and the normal corpus, which is part of the epididymis where sperm are stored. And you can see in the animal with normal CFTR function, wild type, wild type, especially in the boxes that are expanded on the bottom, you can see both the vas and the corpus, they're both normal. Now in the pregnant ferret who was treated with Ivacaptor who had two copies of G551D treated throughout her pregnancy, they were actually able to store, restore both the corpus and the vas. So that's very promising, but this was in utero treatment for the entire pregnancy. And it was only in the animal that had two copies of G551D. If they treated an animal with one copy of G551D and a minimal function mutation, there was still no rescue of the VAS. So we think that in adult men or even late childhood, treating with a highly effective modulator will not rescue the VAS deferens. But what about the other therapeutic options for men with CF? So most definitely men with CF, I said before, mostly produce sperm. So those sperm can be retrieved and you can use assisted reproduction. So in other words, retrieve the sperm and then use in vitro and implant them in the woman so that they can actually have a child that way. So men with CF ask, do I need to stop my modulator because I'm going to try to use assisted reproduction. So again, if you look at the animal model data that I showed you the similar table earlier, there was no impact of any of the modulators tested individually on the chromosomes. So that's really promising news. But one thing you have to think about is if you and your doctor decide that you do want to stop the modulator because you're not sure what's going to happen to the sperm, you have to realize that the average life cycle of the sperm is 74 days. So a man would need to stop his CFTR modulator for over two months before his sperm was retrieved to make sure that there was no presence of a modulator. The other thing to think about is whether or not after a man's partner has been implanted with the embryo, should the man wear a condom for the remainder of the wife's pregnancy or the partner's pregnancy? So there has been some modeling of small molecules of which the modulators are 
to figure out whether or not they're present in semen? And the answer is yes, they probably are at the same concentration in semen as they are in the blood. And when there's sexual intercourse, 100% of that five milliliters of the semen is probably absorbed through the vaginal wall and then therefore into the blood of the mother. But again, that's a very small volume. And studies suggest that there's no further risk to the fertilized egg from small molecules that are absorbed in this way. So switching back to talking a little bit more about women, Tracy told you earlier that women are reporting the desire to have children. And if you look at data from the CF patient registry, which is shown here on the Y axis is the number of pregnancy, pregnancies on the X axis is the year. So you can see that over time, generally the number of pregnancies have been going up a lot. The line on the top of the graph actually shows you the percentage of women that were pregnant in that year. And you can see that recently that also has been rising. So what do we know about pregnancy complications and infant outcomes in women with CF? There have been some very large database studies, both national databases and state databases that have looked at this question. So from large databases, we know that there are increased complications in women with CF who become pregnant compared to women without CF. For example, for the mom, we see diabetes, infection, not surprisingly, pulmonary exacerbations most often, preterm labor, and gestational hypertension or high blood pressure, and an extreme form of that called preeclampsia, where you start to see problems with organs like the kidneys. In infants that are born to women with CF, we do see higher rates of congenital anomalies, so a little bit more than twice the percentage that we see in women without CF, increased rates of jaundice, more often, they're born by C-section or assisted delivery such as forceps or vacuum and premature delivery under 37 weeks. In a recent database study from the UK that was just published this year, they found that decreased lung function was associated with decreased gestational age and birth weight. So in other words, the lower a woman's lung function, the more likely it was that she was going to have a premature baby that had a lower birth rate, birth weight, sorry. So when we're thinking about medication safety in pregnancy and lactation, we really have to find the balance between the benefit to the mom of taking the drug, the risk to her to stopping the drug, and the risk that the drug poses to the fetus. Previously, drugs were categorized by the FDA as A through D or X, and it was decided that that was too simplistic. So the new rule is called the Pregnancy and Lactation Labeling Rule. The requirements for this rule are first, that in animal studies, how much drug was given compared to the maximum recommended human dose has to be reported, and then what happened to the fetus as a result of that dose. Also, the person submitting the application must say, are there adequate and well-controlled studies in pregnant women to say if there was a drug associated risk of major birth defects or miscarriage? So the question then is, do CFTR modulators impact pregnancy and lactation? And this slide's a little bit busier, but again, it's a similar table that I've shown you before. So for Ivacaftor, you can see that there was at toxic doses to the mom, a decrease in fetal body weight in rats. We didn't see that for Lumicaftor. And in Tezacaftor, there was also decreased fetal body weight, as well as early developmental delay of pinna attachment, which is the attachment to the ear, to the head, and eye opening. Again, that was at toxic doses. For Alexacaftor, there was also decreased fetal body weight in rats at toxic doses. So all in all, this suggests that at normal human doses, we don't expect major issues with the individual different modulators. But also women, of course, consider breastfeeding. So we do know from these animal models that each one of the individual modulators is present in breast milk. Importantly, when 
baby rats, so juvenile rats aged seven to 35 days were given Ivacaftor, they did develop cataracts at all the doses that were used. So there's a warning in the label for all of the modulators that contain Ivacaftor, so Lydeco, and then all of the drugs that contain Ivacaftor, so or can be Simdaco and Trikafta, that says that if a child is given a modulator, they should have a cataract assessment to determine if they develop cataracts. And we know now that there have been a few reports of cataracts, but it hasn't been widespread in children. And Kaleidico, in fact, is approved down to four months of age in the US and now also in Europe and the UK. So we talked about the potential risks of use of modulators during pregnancy and lactation. So the other question when you're thinking about that balance is, is it safe to stop modulators? So there was a report written by doctors Aaron Trimble and Scott Donaldson that talked about something called Ivacaftor withdrawal syndrome. They reported on three people with CF who suddenly had to or ended up stopping their modulator. And each one of their cases is shown in the graphs on the right side. So on the y-axis for these graphs is FV1% predicted, so their lung function. And on the x-axis is the months since starting Ivacaftor. And you can see the arrows pointing to the places where they stopped their Ivacaftor. And in all cases, you can see that people had very substantial drops and very sudden drops in their lung function. And unfortunately, one person actually died after acutely stopping their Ivacaftor. There was another report at the North American CF Conference in 2018 that looked at the data for people who were participating in the phase two randomized trial of triple combination therapy. So of course, some people were randomized to placebo and some were randomized to drug, but everybody had to stop at the end of the trial. And what they saw was that trial participants experienced lung function decline in seven out of 10 cases, and five people had pulmonary exacerbation, including two people who needed intravenous antibiotics, or sorry, three people who needed intravenous antibiotics and two who actually had to be hospitalized. So there is some risk for some people when they stop their modulators. So I've told you that women with CF desire pregnancy. Their fertility is likely increased by the use of highly effective modulators and women with CF are having more babies. However, we have very little data on the use of CFTR modulators in pregnant women with CF. So from 2018 to 2019, myself and Dr. Ed Nash, who's in the UK, and Peter Middleton, who's in Australia, collected data from CF centers around the world, asking about the pregnant women who decided to stay on their modulators, Kaleidico or Cambi and Simdaco, during their pregnancy. We're currently also collecting data right now just here in the US, since it's been approved here for a year, on Trikafta. So what did we find? So in women who either stayed on Kaleidico or Cambi or Simdaco during their pregnancy, the use of CFTR modulators during all or part of their pregnancy resulted in two maternal complications that were deemed related to CFTR modulator therapy. One was an episode of pulmonary exacerbation that the investor that the researcher thought was related to use of Orcambi, and the other was a case of acute myelocytic leukemia that they thought was related, although there are no other reports in the literature of such a relationship. The miscarriage rate for women with CF on modulator therapy was 4.7%, which is actually lower than the 10 to 15% we see reported in the general population. Also, cessation of modulator therapy resulted in clinical decline in nine women prompting resumption of therapy during pregnancy. Finally, no modulator-related complications were reported in infants exposed in utero. That was for Orcambi, Simdaco, and Kaleidico. We have had actually a number of reports already turned into us for women who stayed on Trikafta during pregnancy. So to date, a total of 25 completed pregnancies have been reported. In 13 out of 19 of the live births, Trikafta was continued throughout the entire pregnancy. 
three women experienced clinical decline after stopping their trikafta and subsequently restarted during their pregnancy. There were three women who experienced a first trimester miscarriage. Their FV1 ranged from 29 to 117. One woman actually experienced a first trimester miscarriage after she discontinued her trikafta. There were also two women who underwent therapeutic abortion because of unplanned pregnancies after they started trikafta. So in terms of outcomes, 13 maternal complications were reported, and those were generally those things that we already know about that occur in pregnancies in women with CF, including diabetes, hemoptysis, gestational hypertension, and preterm labor. Most of these were deemed unrelated to trikafta use. There were two complications that were deemed of uncertain relatedness to trikafta use. One was cholecystitis or gallbladder disease that resulted in cholecystectomy, although the woman stayed on her modulator throughout the rest of her pregnancy and did fine. And then one episode of preeclampsia where the doctor said, I'm not really sure if it's related or not. There were 10 infant complications reported. Again, those were generally things that we see that are common in infants born to women with CF, including prematurity, the need for C-section and assisted delivery. And most of these were deemed unrelated to trichapter use. There were two complications in infants that were deemed of uncertain relatedness to trichapter use, including one infant who had congenital cysts and transiently had elevated liver enzymes and one who had mild congenital heart disease and a mother with poorly controlled CF-related diabetes, which is a known risk factor for cardiac disease in infants. So what about breastfeeding? I told you that from animal models, we know that there is presence of the modulators in breast milk. So 40 infants were or are being breastfed while the mother is on modulator therapy. 13 infants whose mother was on Kaleidico, nine on Canby, five Simdico, and 14 on Trikafta. So far, no infants have been reported to have cataracts, although only four have had formal assessment for cataracts. And no module-related complications were reported in any of the infants exposed during lactation. So what are our future research directions? I mentioned that fertility is likely increased in women with CF. There's an ongoing study by Dr. Andrea Rowe that's actually looking at cervical mucus quality before and after trikafta use. I also mentioned that the desire of people with CF to become parents, and Tracy also talked about this, is actually increasing. And there's insufficient data in the modern era so Dr. Raksha and Jane and I are actually conducting a retrospective study where we look backwards in time through charts to answer this question. And there's a qualitative parenthood study that's being led by Dr. Tracy Kazmersky and myself where we're asking parents about, or about their attitudes and beliefs about becoming parents. Of course, 90% approximately of the adult CF population is now eligible in the US for highly effective modulator therapy, but we don't have a lot of data about the use during pregnancy other than what I just presented to you. So we are going to prospectively study pregnancy in both those women who stay on modulators and those who decide to stop modulators and those who aren't eligible for modulators. And that study is set to begin at the end of the first quarter, so around spring of 2021. So in summary, men and women with CF desire more information about sexual and reproductive health from their CF providers. The number of people with CF who desire and are having children is increasing. Women with CF have reproductive anatomy that's very similar to that of women without CF, but the majority of men with CF are infertile. The use of highly effective modulator therapy likely increases fertility in women with CF, but doesn't change it in men with CF. Finally, retrospective studies of women with CF who use modulators during pregnancy and breastfeeding have shown no alarming safety signals to date, but we really, really need prospective data to be able to answer questions 
definitively about the use of modulators during pregnancy and during conception for men with CF who choose to use assisted reproduction. So with that, I'd like to thank all the centers that contributed to the data. Olivia Stransky actually works with Tracy Kazmersky and does a lot of the data collection and interviewing for her. The CF Foundation Women's Health Research Working Group, of which we're a part, and we have several other partners that we work with. And mostly, most importantly, the women and men with CF who have worked with us to answer some of these questions. We also want to thank the CF Foundation Therapeutics Development Network, who sponsors the Women's Health Research Working Group, and again, the foundation for sponsoring this webinar and funding the research, and also the Asher Family Fund, who's contributed funding as well to be able to study some of these questions. And now I'm going to turn it back over to Jackie, who is going to moderate the question and answer session. Thank you, Tracy and Jen. That was a lot of exciting and information and great steps toward understanding sexual reproductive health in people with CF. I am sure all of you out there still have tons of questions. Please use the Q&A tab so we can, we can see them and try to answer them. We obviously won't be able to get all, to all of them today, but um, we will address as many as we can. Um, we did have many questions that were submitted with registration and on, right now I would like to start with one of those. So the question is, are there any considerations for men with CF as they age? Tracy, I think you're a good one for this. Yeah, so, you know, I think that as we were doing these interviews with providers and patients um, and then working with our stakeholder group, we really did um, talk a lot about this. So I think that the fertility issues and um, the use of assisted reproductive technology is certainly one thing that was well covered today. Um, hypogonadism or testosterone deficiency, um, we really don't understand the long-term impact of that on CF health outcomes or the um, prevalence of that in men with CF, but we do know that just in the general population that that can really lead to bone mineral density issues um, and other concerns. I think that um, we would be remiss to think that, that men with CF aren't experiencing some of the same sexual functioning concerns as women with CF, especially around coughing during sex, um, hemoptysis during sex, or excessive flatulence during sex. And I think that, um, you know, there has been, have been studies that have looked at uh, increased rates of colon cancer as well as testicular cancer um, in men with CF. So I think that as our population ages, we really do need to be um, looking at this and knowing how to counsel um, our adult men with CF around these issues. And then finally, I think, again, as our population ages, we need to see what happens to rates of erectile dysfunction um, or other men's health issues as, as people age. Great, and then I'm noticing one in the Q&A that kind of is in the same line. Um, the question is, to clarify, is the recommendation for men with CF planning on starting a family to stop their CFTR modulators for three months? That's a really great question. And so the answer is it's really important to discuss it with your physician because your physician is going to have to weigh the risk to your health declining prior to you maybe needing general anesthesia to undergo sperm aspiration versus the potential risk to the fetus. So there wasn't any evidence in the animal models of toxicity to the chromosomes, so it would be carried in the sperm from the modulators. However, we don't have a lot of data on men with CF for this issue. So if a man and his physician decide that they are concerned that there could be an impact in spite of the animal model data suggesting that there isn't, then they would need to stop it for three months so that it would completely start with a fresh slate of sperm. Okay, but I, I learned so much from these talks. I absolutely love these. Even if it doesn't obviously relate to me, I know it's really helping people out there. Um, we did have a, another interesting one. Oh, I, hold on, I just lost it. Uh, oh, I, I'll find that one in a second, but I do have another one. 
Um, is there a guide or somewhere where they can find a guide for pediatric care teams to start having these sexual reproductive health discussions? Yeah, so I can take this one. Um, there isn't a guide for the care team, um, but I think that that is something that um, really would be beneficial for our teen and young adult patients, um, as I think pediatric care teams uh, ideally should be having these discussions early and often with their patients. Um, I think my personal advice uh, is really to, to think about um, having patient educational resources at the ready if you're going to create that space to have those conversations. So the Center for Young Women's Health is a, is a inclusive website um, that talks about everything from acne to uh, sexual and reproductive health and CF. So I, I like that resource quite a bit. I think too that having partnerships as a pediatric center um, with your adolescent and young adult medicine colleagues, if that is an option, or with gynecologists um, or primary care providers that are comfortable with teen patients um, would be a really good kind of list to get ready. Um, and then I think, you know, the partnership enhancement program at the CF Foundation um, is thinking through ways to kind of open this conversation up uh, around sexual and reproductive health. So the Women's Health Research Working Group has been partnering with them um, to think about um, handouts or other kind of simple things to really create that space. I'm sure that's greatly needed. And that's a great project to be working on. And I did find the one that I thought was very interesting that I would like to get your guys' opinion on. Are there trans CF people's reproductive health um, that needs to be addressed with all this research going on? Yeah, I think the answer is 100% yes. And Dr. Raksha Jain, who's part of the Women's Health Research Working Group, is very focused on this question. And she's actually surveyed um, center care directors about their discussions and their knowledge of this issue. And so hopefully she'll be publishing the data from that survey. But yes, we absolutely have it on our radar. And there's a nice summary article that was in the Journal of Cystic Fibrosis by several of, of us, as well as um, kind of members of gender uh, diverse clinics uh, adolescent medicine providers that wrote a very brief short report on the care for gender diverse youth and CF um, that gives really nice um, evidence and kind of things to really be thinking about as the care team in regards to using preferred pronouns, preferred names, to making it a really inclusive space for patients um, and their families. That's, that's really cool. I love hearing that everybody is being included and everybody is being talked about. That's really important to all of us. Now, switching gears a little bit to uh, women's health, we had a question come in that says, the stats about pap smears and prenatal care are interesting, but these are these, these women, I'm sorry, excuse me. These women are accustomed to meds and exams. So why do you think they don't do these tests? I think that's a great question. Um, and this is not data that is unique to the US. Um, there's been several, there's a group in France who's been doing a lot of work around cervical cancer screening, which is pap smears, pelvic exams, um, and rates in women with CF. And, and they found really similar numbers. I think that, you know, part of it is when you don't have a primary care provider who's routinely kind of checking in and keeping up to, to task on things. Um, sometimes these things can be kind of left to the wayside. And I also think that we as CF providers really don't have this as front of mind, um, what, even though we're seeing our patients so often. Um, so I think it's that. I also think that, you know, if you have many health issues, um, with your CF in general, your pap smear is probably not going to be your topmost priority either. Um, so, you know, I think that that it may be a multitude of issues. Um, one interesting thing that we asked about in the last survey is, would you like a women's health provider as part of the CF care team? And half of the adult women said that they might be interested in that. So I think it's an intervention to think about and explore, although we really need to rethink what the CF care model looks like if we're gonna be bringing in folks um, 
more folks to the to the clinic day. Oh, I, I can admit that's not my favorite test, so I may skip it more than I should, but they, we're all human. All right, unfortunately, we are already running low on time. So this is gonna be our uh, last, last question for the evening, unfortunately. And the one we have is, I heard women with CF go through menopause sooner. I have G551D mutation, and I'm wondering if this applies to me. Yeah, I think it's a great question and one that we don't really know the answer to because honestly, women with CF weren't living on average long enough to experience menopause in the past, so it has not been well studied. And I think that was reported in the past, but I happen to have the great fortune to work here at National Jewish where we have a lot of late diagnosed people with CF. And so I, my oldest patient is 79, who's on Trikafta. Um, we didn't see that in that older group, but that doesn't mean that people who were diagnosed at childhood won't have an earlier onset of menopause. But I can certainly think of women both who have been early and those who have had it at a generally standard time. So it's something that we'll be looking at over the upcoming years. Thanks, Jen, that, that's really helpful. I love all these questions coming in and I wish we had time for all of them, but we really don't. I could talk about this all night. On behalf of the panelists, the CF Foundation and those behind the scenes making this all run smooth, we wanna thank everyone for attending tonight. I hope you have enjoyed it as much as I have and that you've come away learning something new or a renewed interest in reproductive health. If you missed anything, don't worry. Everyone who registered will be emailed the link to this recording or it will be on the CFF uh, YouTube channel, um, I believe tomorrow. And um, that's all I have for tonight, fellas. I wish you all a pleasant evening and good health. Thank you all. Thanks, everybody. Have a good night. Bye. Good night. Bye. Thanks for joining us.